This is Dennis Ramondi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, author of American Veda. Uh, our guest today, Jennifer Hollis. She is a music thanatologist at the Leahy Clinic Medical Center in Burlington, Massachusetts, and is the president of the Music Thanatology Association International. She received a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School. Her book, Music at the End of Life, Easing the Pain and Preparing the Passage, and I should say to our listeners, I first became familiar with uh, uh, Jennifer from the uh, article that was in the New York Times. Uh, very, uh, very interesting article about your work. Jennifer, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on our uh, show today. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real honor to be here, and I appreciate being invited. Jennifer, this is Phil. Um, let's begin by letting our listeners know something about you personally and mm -hmm. um, what um, your your own spiritual path is and how you came to do the unusual and interesting work you do. Maybe you can give sure. us a brief overview. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so in terms of my own spiritual, religious life, um, I'm Episcopalian. I was baptized an Episcopalian, and um, I still am a practicing Episcopalian, and I'm actually the, the co-warden of my Episcopal church in Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, and I encountered music thanatology for the first time uh, when I was pretty young. Um, I was 21. I was going into my senior year of college, and I read an article about it in uh, the Connecticut College Alumni Magazine. I had just come home from a summer internship in Madrid. I was going through a pile of mail. And I encountered this article um, written by a faculty member about this school of music thanatology that I would eventually attend. Um, and I think for me, you know, it was really a kind of aha moment because music thanatology brought together the two longings that I had for my life at that time. Um, one was that uh, I really wanted to have a creative life. You know, I wanted to, I had always been a musician. I played piano as a kid. I, I took up the flute. Once I had two instruments, my music teachers thought, well, we're going to need a cellist in the junior high orchestra. Maybe Jenna learned cello, so I learned cello. And I played trombone for a few vague weeks um, in college. I sang in an a cappella group, um, which was um, really fun at the time, but not as cool as the Pitch Perfect movies have made it at this point. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, um, I, I just always loved having music in my life, but I didn't want to be a performer. I didn't want to be a concert pianist. I wasn't, you know, writing songs and trying to make it as a songwriter of some kind. Um, so I didn't quite know what to do with music except to have it be something that I did on the side. Um, but I also had this real longing to be of service. I, I wanted to um, do good in the world. I, I was on track to become an elementary school teacher. I was interested in working with young people. I had a lot of sort of thoughts and concerns about social justice in the world. Um, I, you know, now I would say I was looking for a ministry, but I didn't really have that word at that time. So um, I, really, I thought about it in terms of service. So when I read about music thanatology for the first time, all of that kind of coalesced into one thing um, that looked like a job I could do, <laughs> you know, instead of having to kind of do music on the side or service on the side. Here was something that brought together like my creative life and my longing for ministry all in one place. Um, so I decided to go to the school that I'd read about. Um, at that time, there was only one school, so my post-college adventure was to uh, drive across the country to Missoula, Montana, and um, do a, a two-year training and then a one-year certification program um, in playing harp and singing for dying people. Well, you, uh, I, I want to say I, I read the book uh, last week, your book, uh, Music at the End of Life, and it was fascinating. And I have to say, I have very little familiarity with uh, thanatology. <laughs> it's a sci uh -huh. science and study of death, and it, it, it looks at the, uh, I'm reading about it, mechanisms and forensic aspects, but also the uh, psychological and social aspects related to death. It's something, you know, I, I'm very familiar with hospice work, and, and it's something as you get older, you become more interested in because something everybody has to deal <laughs> right. with in their own life, and, and, and you really do. Right. It's the last great mystery. It, it's something that uh, it's sometimes hard to look at this. And, and I'm just um, uh, uh, curious in terms of your d direct experience. Now, first of all, playing the harp for people, settling them down. What, what a great idea. I, I never actually mm. considered that possibility. Has it been a 
transformative experience for you doing this work in terms of your own inner life, your, your spirituality, your, your uh, looking at what life is and what it is not, and uh, how has it affected you directly? Yeah, um, that's a really great question, and um, it's one I've thought a lot about. Uh, it definitely has been transformative, um, and I, I feel I feel especially lucky to have come to it as a young adult. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, I I started this work in my twenties, and I got certified in my twenties, and so I have had a long time now. I mean, it's it's almost twenty years at this point since I started my training, um, I've had a number of years to really reflect on it and, and think about kind of what does it mean um, that that we have this 100% mortality rate. You know, that mm -hmm. It sounds really obvious, but it's very hard to tune into. Um, so I think for me it's it's been an opportunity to um, um, really confront that, you know, very early on in my life, confront the fact that... Um, that we are all going to die, and and to have real life experiences um, of you know the reality of that um, at a relatively young age, it's very uh, it's kind of hard to deny it when you're playing for people and seeing mm -hmm. it all the time, um, and acknowledging that you know a lot of people associate death and dying with being older, uh, but that's not always the case. You know mm -hmm. we don't we don't always get. Uh, get to grow old. We don't always get to age. Um, there's many, many, many people who die very young. So, so thinking about it in terms of something that um, has been integrated into my life from early adulthood and something I didn't actually have to wait until I was approaching you know, late middle age or old age to confront um, has been a real blessing in my life. The, the other sort of thing that I always like to share that um, I think is a little less obvious and just I've been around death a lot is that I've I, and something that's been really transformative in my own spirituality is um, is these families that I meet and the things that they're willing to share with me mm -hmm. um, the kind of the beautiful intimacy that I witness from the patients and their families as they struggle to say goodbye to one another you know as they try to find the words, try to find the gestures, the prayer, like whatever it is they want to do in the music vigil while I'm playing, um, uh, to be a witness to that has been, um, you know, one of the great teachers of my life. I mean, these families have, and these patients have mm -hmm. been just such teachers to me. Um, you know, they, I feel like I, because what I do is play music, I've been allowed into spaces that, um, maybe other people wouldn't be allowed into, you know, maybe families who would say no to a chaplain or no to a social worker um, might say yes to music mm -hmm. and, and might mm -hmm. allow me to come, um, you know, come do a music vigil with them. So um, they've taught me so much about uh, the dying process um, just through, you know, improvisation is the word that always comes to mind. You know, people, who, you know, maybe didn't have any experience with death and dying until they were called to the hospital to go be with someone, um, kind of making it up right in the moment, you know, holding hands or telling stories or cradling each other in their arms or just this, you know, I think people, people always want to say to me, oh, that must be so hard. You see so much suffering. And, you know, I do see suffering, but I also see just so much love and so mm -hmm. much beauty. And that's the hard, that's the thing that's hard to, um, express because these moments are also moments of suffering. There's that. There's the other. The, the twin of that is this beauty as people are trying to mm -hmm. do this difficult work of saying goodbye. Jennifer, um, you work with people who are dying. Um, at what point are you called in? Um, how do you, uh, how does one know the patient is appropriate for your services? Um, or do you also work with people who are chronically ill or um, terminally ill but aren't what we think of as like imminently dying? Right, right. That's a great question. Um, so I would say music sanitologists, uh, probably everyone who practices sees a, a range of people from the most obvious would be patients who are imminently dying. Um, and so there, you know, there are signs and symptoms of imminent death. Maybe they're on hospice, maybe they're in a hospital, 
and someone basically calls a music thanatologist and says, you know, turn your car around and come right now. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes happens, and sometimes I'm there right at a moment when someone um, someone does die, and I'm a witness to that and present for that. Um, but outside of that, there is a really wide range of people who are at the end of life. Um, there are people who you know, have a terminal diagnosis and are transitioning to hospice but maybe aren't actively dying. Um, and there are also people who might be on a long, slow decline from dementia in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And maybe their actual death isn't going to happen for two years. You know, it might be a very mm -hmm. long time. But they might benefit from music thanatology for all kinds of reasons, you know, for um, rest, relaxation, if they have agitation, um, if they have, you know, some physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, um, if they're struggling, if their family is struggling. Um, a music thanatologist might see someone like that, you know, every couple of weeks for quite a while. Um, so I think every, you know, music thanatologists work with the environment that they're in. Um, I work at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. I work with their palliative care team. Um, and so a hospital setting is a very particular, um, very particular environment. So I sometimes see patients who are actively dying. I sometimes see patients who are preparing to leave the hospital to transition to hospice. Um, sometimes I see patients who have like a particular symptom that, that music might help. But that's a different environment than, say, um, someone, a music thanatologist that might work for a, a hospice inpatient unit mm -hmm. where um, they're in a, a very different environment. Or, you know, a, a private practice that might have uh, contracts with nursing homes and with hospitals and with um, other medical institutions, and they might see a, a wide range. So, uh, but to, to really answer your question, when are you called in? <laughs> um, typically, a music thanatologist uh, does ongoing education with the interdisciplinary team so that nurses and social workers and chaplains and physicians that they work with know who might benefit from music thanatology and can make referrals, you know, when mm -hmm. it's appropriate for them. I wanted to mention that the uh, article in the New York Times uh, providing the soundtrack for Life's Last Moments was written by uh, Jennifer Hollis, and uh, it appeared uh, in the New York Times August 1st, 2015. So anybody that wants to look that up in Google, they can, they can read that article, and I would recommend it. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, uh, are mm -hmm. there common, in your experience? Uh, Dennis, let me, let me yeah. interrupt you. I, I, the date I have is December 30th. All right. Uh, here it says by August 1st. So uh, <laughs> well, maybe it appeared I, I twice. Actually... I can help with that. There are two different articles. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, ah. okay. Yeah. Well, they can Google you and find yeah. it. Great. They can. Okay, so I'll <laughs> right. read the other we'll article. Your uh, are there certain common themes or common experiences that you see when somebody is approaching, you know, the end of their life, both, both in the person, especially in the person that, that, is, that uh, is, is, is passing away, and assuming the person is conscious and aware uh, that, uh, of what's going on, and also of those uh, closest to them. Uh, are there certain common things that you often see? That's an interesting question. Um, well, let me think about it. Um, there are certainly physical signs of imminent death that happen for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their respirations may change. Their skin tone sometimes changes. Um, there's something called modeling that can happen um, in the fingers or in the knees, and that's just sort of where, as, as the circulatory system slows down, blood starts to pool in various parts of the body. Um, so there are kind of physical symptoms that you can you can see in people, and and I can you know walk into a room and and with a, a little bit of an assessment process have a sense of kind of where people mm -hmm. are. Um, Although that process is very mysterious, and <laughs> there have been people that um, I thought were actively dying that you know lived quite a bit longer, or, or people that I was surprised right. you know when they actually did die. Um, so there's this you know this physical um, sense that I see. Um, in terms of sort of common themes that I see in the patient and the family that I see, um, one thing is that. Uh, I think the reason that people are so grateful for music thanatology um, is that I feel like people are very hungry for, for beauty and for this kind of space um, in these settings. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. when a music thanatologist 
comes, you know, it's the first time they've been in the hospital where nobody had to do anything. (laughs) They don't have to talk to me. They don't have to host me. They don't have to answer questions. They don't have to tell me their story. You know, I, I give them a little bit of an introduction of what it's going to look and feel like. And then the music kind of mediates everything else. And then we just kind of go from there. So, um, a lot of times what I see is that people, um, you know, after 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, um, everyone kind of leans back in their chair. <laughs> Sometimes mm-hmm. there's literally like an, an audible sigh from someone's mouth. And um, I think, oh, okay. Like they've, they've when, when someone you love is dying, of course, and, and you're waiting and you're going back and forth to the hospital, you know, it's so stressful and mm-hmm. so hard to know what to do and to have just a little bit of time that's, different from everything else. You know, it's different from having a nurse come in and take care of you. It's different from a visit from a doctor. Um, It can be very intimate. It can also be very beautiful. And um, I think a lot of people uh, are, they don't expect that the music is going to feel as good as it does. (laughs) And then when they do, um, they're delighted to be able to rest in it. A lot of times what happens is people fall asleep and I always tell them that it's okay. You know, it's not a Mm -hmm. concert. They don't have to be, you know, they don't have to behave Mm -hmm. themselves. And if what they really need is to fall asleep, that's fine. The patient might fall asleep. Their loved ones might fall asleep. I always say like, close your eyes. I'll tiptoe out if, if everyone in the room is asleep and, um, and that's, you know, it's absolutely fine. I also think, um, you know, the dying process can be really, isolating for people you know they don't know quite what to do they don't know what to say they don't know how to witness the suffering and having a music thanatologist kind of um just just take over those moments for a little bit means that everyone can can relax the other thing i when i interviewed um, dr martha twaddle for my book she talked about music thanatology as like the medicine that you can give to patients and their families Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. it's it's something that everyone can receive at the same time. Mm. You don't, um, you know, you can give morphine to the patient, but not to everybody else. And sometimes, and I sometimes think about it as like concentric circles where um, if the family relaxes, then the patient can relax. Or if the patient relaxes because of the music, then the family can relax. Mm. Like there's some kind of interplay. Um, but, you know, it, the other thing I, I'm, I always happy to say is that, um, you know, music thanatology isn't for everyone. You know, it isn't sometimes this kind of intimacy and, and space together is too much. And, and I always tell families, um, if that's the case, you know, I'll check in. You can just let me know you've had enough and that's fine. So there are some families who really rest into it deeply and other families that feel like mm, that's, that's not what we were hoping for. Thanks. Pres- presumably, uh, Jennifer, you're sometimes in the room alone with a dying patient um, yes. and, and, while um, this is of benefit to the family, the, the prime purpose is to ease the transition and, and yes. make it a, a comfortable and smooth for the dying person. Presumably, they might be uh, fearful and anxious and in pain and so forth. <clears throat> so one can imagine that music can play a beautiful role because it does for all of us just in ordinary life or when we're not mm. feeling right or when we're sick, we we often yeah. will turn to music. Um, yeah. So I'm curious about two aspects of it. One, yeah. why the harp? And, right. and two, uh-huh. what kind of music do you play? Um, uh-huh. Or uh, compositions, improvisation? Uh, maybe you can explain mm-hmm. some of that. Yeah, right. That's a great question. Um, I'll start with what kind of music. So in, in my training and in music thanatology trainings, we all learn a shared repertoire of music. Um, there's some chant, there's some sacred song, there's some lullaby. Um, and then I think each music thanatologist then, you know, builds their repertoire from there depending on their interests and their own musicality and the populations they serve and the kinds of things that they think um, – would be helpful. Um, one principle that music thanatologists use in playing for people is um, an idea of using music in a prescriptive way. So um, I always like to sort of clarify that the music I play is not typically um, songs that people might have heard in their childhood or songs that might have been played at their wedding. Um, it doesn't often relate to how old they are, what their cultural or religious or ethnic background is. Um, a lot of the music I we play is 
probably unfamiliar to people. Um, some some people do. I mean, there's no such thing as you know absolutely unfamiliar music. It came from somewhere. Um, but the important thing is is that what we're trying to do as music thanatologists is look at the um, the raw materials of music. So the modality, the rhythm, the harmony. Do I use voice? Do I use harp? Um, even sort of physically, where do I place the harp in relationship to the patient? And then how can those small parts of music kind of interact with the patient in order to relieve suffering. So, um, you know, if someone is very agitated, for example, what are the qualities of music that might help them to become less agitated? You know, if their countenance is pinched, like they're in pain, what are the, what are the raw materials that might help address that? So, um, to us, you know, the, the particular songs we play, I think, are less important than kind of combining this understanding of the prescriptive process with a, a really kind of radical attention to what's going on for the patient moment by moment, and then adjusting and changing the music um, for the patient moment by moment by moment. So um, you end up, hopefully, uh, with um, a delivery of music that that is very individualized, very... Um, uh, nuanced for that particular patient in that particular moment. Um, the reason for the harp, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, the harp is a polyphonic instrument, which just means it's like an organ or a piano. You can play more than one note at a time. So you can get these kind of dense, complicated harmonies from a harp um, that you couldn't get if you were playing the flute or something. Uh, it's um, it's a it's an instrument that you can get a lot of sound out of. Um, my harp is I have a folk harp that's um, about five feet tall. It has a big sound box, um, so you can get a big resonant sound mm -hmm. out of a, a relatively small instrument. Um, it has a wide range of sound. You know, you have deep bass notes, you have kind of twinkly high notes, uh, and it's portable. You know, I can get it into the back of my Honda Fit. I can get it into a hospital room filled with people. I can get it on and off the elevator. Um, and um, so I, I don't think the harp is used to the exclusion of every other instrument in the world. It's just in our particular training for our particular work, um, it seems to, to be very effective. So the association with angels and <laughs> heaven and all that is not part of it, presumably. But um, do you ever sing, you use vocalization as well? We do, yeah. We do um, use harp and vocal music. All of us are trained to do both. Um, I, and, you know, when I interviewed music thanatologists for my book, a lot of what they said was that they save singing for um, moments that are very intimate, you know, moments where... Um, the family and the patient seems very prepared for that. And, and um, because often what happens is that it's, it's the singing that, that makes people weep. And mm. that's certainly my own observation right. as well. Right. Um, not that weeping isn't, isn't a good thing and that many people wouldn't you know, feel like crying and want an opportunity to cry, but just that um, it can be very uh, emotional to have someone sing to you or to sing to your loved one. I mean, it's something that we do. For, for small children, and then for most people, they never have anyone sing to them again. <laughs> right. So I think um, singing is, um, it just has that additional layer of intimacy and closeness with the right. person you're singing for. Yeah, Jennifer, uh, I'm wondering from your side, do you have a wide range of experiences uh, while you're uh, playing the music and, and, and immediately thereafter? It, sometimes are you very settle, sometimes are you bored or you have anxiety? Uh, or do you have a pretty consistent experience when you do it? Oh, what a great question. No one has ever <laughs> asked me that before. Uh, that's terrific. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because I think this really gets to the idea that I've been chewing on about, like, growing up in music anthology, mm -hmm. you know, from a young adult into middle age. Um, and I would say that when I was a younger music anthologist, I had a much more consistent, settled grounded experience at the bedside. I think, um, I think I, I'm having an inverse experience from some of my colleagues uh, who uh, tend, to, tend to say, oh, I've gotten used to being around death, you know, who, who share with me, like, I used to be fearful of it, and now I feel more settled and, like, I, it's fine. Um, for me, I feel like the older I've gotten, the more aware of my own mortality and the mortality, the reality of what I do is coming into sharper focus. And um, 
I think I'm less emotionally detached than I was as a young person. Mm. And um, I think, um, yeah, you know, I have had excellent training and I've had a lot of experiences. So most of this is my own inner reflection um, on on my work and not something that sort of happens in the moment where I'm playing for people. Um, but I do notice more of a range of experiences, um, you know, from the very profound and very connected to um, the, you know, sometimes I find things very, very moving. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I get really kind of emotionally engaged in what's happening. Um, sometimes, you know, what's happening is just as overwhelming for me as it is for other people in the room. And, and you know, I mm-hmm. have to sort of rely on my own practices to stay grounded and stay present to it. Um, but it, it, I do feel like I, I have a, had a wide range, and it's, it's getting wider. <laughs> and, and how has that range of experience affected your uh, spiritual life? Has it, has it changed anything in the way you understand uh, religion or your own tradition or your understanding or sense of uh, human, uh, the human condition in relation to uh, the divine or the afterlife? Has any, any of that changed or evolved through your work? It definitely has, and it's um, that's it's such a big question. It's hard to know exactly how to pull out the threads. Um, I think for me, one of the ways that music thanatology has informed my own spiritual life um, is that, in in many ways, music thanatology is my spiritual practice. Um, mm-hmm. The idea that um, you know coming coming to the harp, coming to the bedside again and again. Um, I think of it exact, probably in the same way as I, you know, I used to think about coming to the piano bench to learn that or coming to the meditation cushion or coming to the church service. Um, I, I know now the importance of, um, of doing the spiritual practice. You know, there's no, there's, you don't arrive somewhere. <laughs> there's not some moment where you're like, oh, well, I'm done meditating now. I finished that. <laughs> you know, it's, there's always um, new things that come up. There's always, and that's, it's constantly engaging. And so um, that, that constant engagement and seeing the changes in, in my own inner life at the bedside helps to inform the constant engagement that I have in, um, you know, in my prayer life, in, um, in my fledgling meditation practice, in, in all of that. Um, it just helps me realize that, uh, I, you know, the work I do is at a hospital, so I'm constantly crossing a threshold of the hospital, the doorway of the hospital room, the doorway of the hospital room, mm-hmm. and I don't always know what's going to be on the other side of that. So my spiritual practice is to just knock on the door and go in and knock on the door and assume that and aspire to the idea that what I bring will have some meaning and, and will will um, serve. Right. Uh, and and go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, and that you know, and that informs my lifelong conversation um, mm-hmm. with God, with my other spiritual practices. That the important thing is to just go to the threshold, and and keep going. But Jennifer, this has been fascinating uh, and, and new to me. I, I did not know about music manentology until I read the article about you in the New York Times. And I want to also mention again, your book, Music at the End of Life, Easing the Pain and Preparing the Passage. And uh, I I had a final question before we go to Phil, and that was, if somebody wants to uh, 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 find a music uh, planetologist, uh, somebody wants to connect their hospice to uh, somebody that can provide the service you provide, how do they go about uh, finding uh, a person to come in and play music? And uh, how many music thanatologists are there in the United States and worldwide? Sure, um, that's a great question. There are um, there are less than a hundred in the United States. Mm-hmm. I don't have the exact number right now. It's somewhere between sixty and a hundred. So it's a very small, specialized field. Um, if someone is interested in finding a music thanatologist, they can go to the music. As- Thanatology Association International website. That's just mtai.org, 
And uh, there's a link there that just says associates mm-hmm. and keyword search by state and, um, and hopefully find someone in your area. I have a follow-up question for that, uh, Jennifer, which is uh, if there are only 100 of you, that averages out to two per state. Right. Uh, um, what would you advise people who have loved ones who may be uh, transitioning uh, or, or want to um, prepare for their own uh, death at, uh, when the time comes, uh, uh-huh. who cannot find a music thanatologist and yep. uh, somebody to come with a harp? Um, mm-hmm. it, how can one bring music appropriately into this and take advantage of what you've learned in the absence of some a specialist like you? Right, that's a great question. Um, and I really appreciate uh, using the word uh, appropriate because I think part of what music thanatology has taught me um, is to be um, just judicious in the use of music with people who are physically vulnerable. Um, and so I think, you know, music thanatology exists within a big context of music in medical settings. So if you live someplace where you just can't find a music thanatologist, you might um, look around and see if there are music therapists in your area. Um, That's a different field with different training and certification, but there are music therapists that specialize in end-of-life care. Um, Some of them even play the harp. You might look into that. Um, There are therapeutic musicians that have different trainings. There are all kinds of different therapeutic music programs, so there might be someone in your area that does that. You know, there are many, many hospices that have volunteer musicians, uh, very talented musicians who feel called to do this kind of work. You might, you know, look in your area. Maybe you're looking for a hospice and you want to make sure you find one that does have music um, that can offer there. And there's also, of course, the entire body of recorded music. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think most of your listeners have thousands of songs in their phone in their pocket right now. (laughs) So they might think about, you know, what, what is the music that is most meaningful to them, and most evocative, most relaxing? Um, you know, if they have someone they love that's dying, is there music that they know um, that might be useful to them? It might not be exactly what comes off the top of their head. They might have to have a little digging or discussions. But, you know, there's so much conversation now about advanced care planning and making your wishes known. You know, including music in that conversation, I think, can be incredibly helpful. And, you know, not just music, but other kinds of arts. You know, just letting your family know, uh, yes, I definitely would love a harp, or no way. (laughs) Please don't don't bring the (laughs) harpist in. (laughs) I want Jimi Hendrix. (laughs) I want Purple Haze play. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> big, big That's a doors, great conversation. Great <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Jennifer, so make a list and send yeah. it to your loved ones. Yeah. Thank you so, so very much for taking the time to come on today. And thank you for the wonderful service you provide to people. I mean, it must be very fulfilling knowing that you are bringing uh, uh, comfort in, in many, many cases uh, to, to folks who are going through a very difficult time. And, and again, the book, Music at the End of Life, uh, easing the Pain and Preparing the Passage, Jennifer L. Hollis. Uh, I read it. I enjoyed it. I recommend it. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Spirit Matters Talk, spiritmatterstalk.com. Uh, Phil, any final words? No, I just want to mention Jennifer's website is uh, jenniferhollis.com, and if they want to uh, connect with her, they can find her on the web. Thank, thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a fantastic conversation. I'm really, I really appreciate it.